this morning is Senator Karen Pearson, and she represents New Orleans and parts of Jefferson Parish in the Louisiana State Senate. She is the immediate past chair of the Louisiana Women's Caucus and the current chair of the Senate Select Committee on Women and Children. She also serves on the Senate Judiciary B Committee, the Insurance and Local and Municipal Committees. In 2012, she assumed the chair position of the Louisiana Democratic Party and is the first woman to do so in Louisiana history. So let's welcome Senator Karen Carter-Peterson. Thank you so much, Ebony. And Ebony is one of the wonderful assets that we have at the Louisiana Democratic Party. Um, Ebony joined us recently, even more formally, as our new director of um, outreach at the Louisiana Democratic Party. So you all have a gym right here on your campus. Uh, let me first say uh, thank you for the invitation to, to speak and to address you here at the Mandela School of Public Policy at Southern University. Um, I'm a proud graduate of an HBCU. I cannot say that I have uh, the Jaguars behind my name, but I do have the bison, Mr. Mason. <laughs> and uh, I'm proud of that, uh, being a graduate of uh, Howard University back in 1991. I spent my time there and studied international business and market. Um, before I go too far, I want to give a special thanks and acknowledgement to uh, certainly the president of Southern System, uh, Mr. Ronald Mason. Thank you for having me. And also Dean William Art. Yes, Dean, thanks for having me. And recognize just a few other folks. Dr. Albert Sams, uh, the political science chair. Uh, Dr. Sean Comedy. Dr. Sean Comedy. Nope. Okay. Dr. Dr. Hines is coming as well. Okay, Dr. Hines, Dr. Lorenz, and also, of course, um, I see my friend in the back, Don Hernandez. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to family, extended family. Don's uh, son, Juan, is married to my sister, and so I know he's doing great things here in the African American uh, History Department here at Southern. But I'm here this morning to, uh, to, to speak to you, and I, I once again want to say it's a privilege to come to you and talk to you about, uh, participate in this lecture series, as I understand it, it is entitled Activism Through Education uh, Series. And so it's certainly a great topic and a timely topic with everything that's going on, not just here in Louisiana, but all across the country. Um, before I get into this, I mean, I just want to tell you I am on such a high. Um, this little pin here, I've been wearing my forward pin. I'm on this thing forward, not back, forward, not back. You heard that all last week, right, in Charlotte? Mm -hmm. And I just came back from Charlotte where we had the best convention. I've been to five conventions since 1988, Democratic National Convention. So I started when I was 19, 18 years old. I was the youngest delegate from Louisiana. I ran for delegate. And I, I was a Jesse Jackson delegate back in 1988 in Atlanta. And this is absolutely the best convention ever that I've attended. And I think it's because um, there's such a stark contrast between what we represent in our party and the value system and the morals, and that was, uh, there was heightened awareness to those differences last week through the speeches and the speakers, right? I mean, if you saw President Clinton, of course, but also John Kerry, I mean, where was he when we needed him? Huh? He showed up last week, but we needed him a couple years ago when he was running himself. But I mean, he was just phenomenal. And if you notice, the last day of the convention on Thursday is focused on foreign policy and the military, the thing that the other side forgot to mention, all of uh, our veterans and the folks that are currently fighting for us overseas, were, there was not even a blip about Afghanistan or any of our veterans. And they pride themselves on the other side as taking ownership and protecting America. But yet they didn't talk about it at all. But the entire, all of Thursday was spent on um, you know, honoring those who are worthy of it, that are currently serving, and those that have served in the past, which we all have someone close to us, family or friend, um, that, that is worthy of that honor. So I'm still on that high from last week. Um, it's, it, even some of my Republican colleagues in the legislature have called me and, and talking about how, you know, quietly, of course, they don't want me to put them on blast, but I will put them on blast if, if necessary. Uh, but they, they, are, they were even impressed, and they know how they missed the mark. And we are going home. Mr. Lynn, how are you, sir? Um, we are only going uh, forward with this campaign. We've got home less than two weeks, two, two months left, and things are looking very, very good. But certainly, 
we need you to continue to participate and to, most importantly, to vote on November the 6th. And we can talk more about that in the question and answer. But let me let me just uh, share some things uh, with you. I understand I have about 20, 25 minutes. If I go too long, I know what that means. Mr. Mason, when you raise that hand or give me that wink. Um, but, you know, as, as the things that we're seeing happen in our communities in our state right now, uh, it, it cries out for broader engagement of citizens, and certainly you, uh, citizens that are seeking higher uh, educational attainment at Southern University, calls out for participation at every level. Uh, whether your interest involves responding to challenges in your neighborhood or to issues that affect humanity, across this planet, the opportunity to have an impact, to make a positive difference is, is really about. So the need for engagement is great, okay? We need you, the country needs you, your immediate community needs you. Your neighbors need your intelligence. You know, there are not very many of us that have attained this level of education. And so you, while you look around and you see all of your colleagues and peers here, also trying to attain higher education. We're really in the minority, of the minority, right? And what we have is something that is so valuable to people in our community because they don't, they have not had the opportunity and the experience to further their education beyond that K through 12 oftentimes. And so your city and your immediate community needs the engagement for the challenges that are confronting us, whether it's in new ways of thinking about service, delivery, uh, disaster responses, which we saw just recently with Isaac. Um, and still, we do not have this perfected. It's very clear. You would think after Katrina, Gustav, Ike, and Rita that we would have perfected responding to an emergency and a disaster. But that's not the case. And so I know that many universities, and I know there's some uh, programs here at Southern that offer that kind of insight and opportunity to serve in that way. And I, I specifically mention that because I know I'm also a graduate of Tulane, uh, law school. But Tulane developed something like that, and I would encourage us to look at that here at the largest system, HBCU system in the country, of a, a way to respond to disasters. It's a unique and a, and a real critical place for this, particularly the southeastern United States. And it's not a matter of when or, or whether it's going to happen again, it's a matter of when. So we know they're going to keep coming. And so there's a value, a real opportunity to actually build a career around disaster response. And there's lots of money to be made. If you, don't, if you don't get mad like I get mad when I see all these license plates right after the disasters outside of Louisiana, right? When we can be rebuilding our own community and participate in that economic development, right? So I'm just putting one of those ways to share your intelligence and your uh, different way of thinking with your immediate community. That's another example. Um, but our state desperately needs the engagement uh, as we look at, uh, confront these times. We live in a time of what President Clinton referred to last week as funny arithmetic, right? Where budgets are balanced for two days and then everything changes with a nod and a wink. Where correcting a reimbursement error is viewed as a political opportunity to make a last ditch effort to kill a public hospital system. And that's what's going on right now. Where a governor in the state of Louisiana says no to billions of dollars in high-speed rail to extend rural broadband, right, for early childhood education. And it's the same federal government that he rants and raves about, but he doesn't get enough disaster relief money, which is also federal. Um, and, you know, it's the same federal government that he vilifies. And so, you know, we have to be uh, astute and aware of the hypocrisy and the rhetoric and be able to discern what's real and what's in our best interest. Um, we live in a, a state right now where the cost of cancer, I mean, the cost of paying for the care for people with cancer, HIV and other chronic diseases is viewed as being fiscal burdens, too heavy to bear. But where the state routinely state that I live in, the legislature that I've served in for 13 years, consistently, routinely, without question, gives away billions of dollars in tax revenue to corporations that are already thriving and highly profitable, right? Our priorities are skewed, right? It's time for you to step up. I'm not enough. I'm not going to be the only voice. I'm going on 42 years old. I got a right knee that's cracking. 
And it's time for some people in this room to step up and offer something better. If not you, then who? If not now, then when? So yes, damn straight, your state needs engagement. Amen. <laughs> yes, and they need you right now. By reason of your age, your energy, your education, and your access to information, and the fact that you haven't yet drank the Kool-Aid on the fiscal mumbo jumbo, you are the leader that the state is waiting on. So please, I, I implore upon you and beg you that when your academic quest is finished here at Southern University, uh, that you consider staying put right here in Louisiana, because too often I hear, well, you know, I don't like it right here, the climate's not good, the job opportunity. Well, you know what? If you love this state, you vest in it. Yeah. I told you. You get vested. And the way to get vested is to become engaged and to, to get involved in the community and volunteerism. I'll give you ways specifically, it's not just me as a public servant, I'll give you ways on how I continue to do it outside of the elected position that I hold and the volunteer position I hold in the party. I got four jobs. Number one, I'm a wife, right? Which is the hardest job, I promise you. The second one is that I'm a lawyer so that I can eat. The third one is that I've offered myself a public service as a senator. And the fourth one is I'm the chair of the Louisiana Democratic Party. So tell me that my day is not complicated, but it's certainly not as complicated as the president. Right? And he finds time to exercise and be a family man and do all the other things. That is the inspiration for me, why I stepped up. I said, if this guy can do it, and he says he wants something better for the country to pass bills like Lily Ledbetter, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, then certainly you can do that and you have time in your life to commit to bringing somebody else behind you and lifting somebody else up, including our community. So, what, but, this country needs our engagement, and the United States, of course, dares to be great, a great country from time to time. When it does dare, it mostly succeeds. But we live in what's called a conservative era right now. I believe that description is, is wrong, because there are many people who are saying, even in Louisiana, we live, we live in a conservative state. Right? I think there are a lot of people that are voting against their own economic interest and don't recognize it. And they get caught up in maybe some of the social issues and don't realize that the bottom line, the things that are important, affordable health care, access to uh, at, uh, beyond adequate education, and other things, those things don't are not preeminent and prominent in their voting, in their engagement. And so they need to be better educated as voters. But I don't believe that that conservative era stuff is true here in Louisiana. We live in an era where fears, the fears are inflated. And the risks heighten as a means of preserving the status quo. Stay with me. The fears are inflated. The risks are heightened. And it's done as a means of preserving the status quo. No one wants to give up power. Do you? Whatever power you have, whether it's in your household or in your own uh, um, sphere of influence, who wants to give it up? I mean, that's what we work hard for, whether it's financial power, economic power, right? Mental, emotional power over another human being, nobody wants to give that up, and nor do the Republicans, right? Nor do those that run major corporations. It's not given up, you have to get, go get it. And if we sit idly by, as we have, as evidenced by the voting participation, yes. if we continue to sit idly by, don't expect something different. People will, own, my mother's favorite line, people will only do to you what you let them do. And so if we sit by, we will continue to get the same thing. What definition of insanity? Expecting a different result, right? Right? It makes absolutely no sense. So I, don't, I probably don't have to tell you this, but I'm going to do it anyway. The status quo doesn't work for us, particularly doesn't work for us. It never has. You go back through history, and you know what I'm talking about. It never has worked for us, and we've had to fight for everything. And so. But the status quo works for those that have. And for those that already have and have reaped the rewards of this system that we have, which is a great system. Capitalism is a great system. But it's not about sitting idly by and expecting entitlements and people to do for you, whether it's government or anyone else, right? Um, the rewards of the system that has been garnered to those that have are not going to change unless we act. But this, what this country has always been about, when it's touched its greatness, when it's touched its greatness, has been 
when it has overturned the status quo in search for a more equitable order. You cannot continue to grow the lower class and the impoverished and have those extremes. That's not what the country was built on in the principles, right? The folks in the middle matter, and you have to have that strength. It comes in the form of public safety, the ramifications that is, and the implications for having those extremes. It comes in the form of, of, of problems with public safety, it comes in the form of um, ignorance, right? When we continue to build the two extremes like the other side would like to see us do right now. So the acts that well, by reason for, so yes, the United States needs you because you, by reason of your age and energy and education, are the leader of this, that these, the leaders that this country will need to continue our quest for that more perfect union that we talk about, that equitable, trying to attain equity in this country and trying to attain that more perfect union that the preamble in the Constitution references. So how do we get there? I mean, you've already got a great start. You've done the K through 12 thing. Now you're on to undergrad and grad school. Education is clearly the key. I wouldn't be standing here but for someone in my family making it a priority. My mother didn't get a college education. My, grandparent, my grandmother finished fourth grade. My grandfather was an auto mechanic down in Central City. Grew up in the Cali housing project, right? It's every generation wants something better, right? And if you saw some of the speeches, you remember Mayor Castro from San Antonio when he talked and he talked about his story? Everybody has a story. You didn't just, you don't click your heels, snap your fingers, and you just show up. Somebody struggled for us. The question you should be asking is who are you struggling for right now? Are you just doing your thing? Are you just doing your thing? Because that's not fair to the people that have fought before you and those that have died. And I'm not talking about Martin Luther King. I'm not talking about what Nelson Mandela did. I'm talking about your grandmother, your grandfather, your aunt, your uncle, because your mom wasn't around or your dad wasn't. Who helped you get here? Does that mean something to you? If it does, then act on it. Act on it. Go get that little cousin that's astray right now that you know right now is dropping out of school, standing on a corner, getting into mess, Go grab it. If you don't, who will? I'm about to get off message for a minute. I'm about to get off message, and I'm passionate about this. I'm not off message? Okay, I'm not off message. I gotta stay there for a minute. There are too many of us blaming other people for not raising our children. Now, and I am very upset about this because I hear, uh, you hear the Republicans talk about entitlements and they tap dance around them. They don't talk about race. They just talk about, you know, continuing to reform welfare. They've cut back all the programs that help people to get a, a, a leg up, right? And they've benefited from it too. There was one person in the Republican convention down in Tampa that gave a speech and she talked about building, we built that. That's the whole message, right? We built that, they built everything. Well, she gave a message of she built her business and then somewhere in there she talked about it was a federal contract business. It was a business that was a federal contract. It was all federal kind of, so she knew somebody that helped her build her small business. She ain't built that. <laughs> she got access to some Republican that got her in the administration at the Department of the Navy or somewhere else that got her a contract and for the last 10 years. We built that for her, right? But you got to listen and appreciate that. So back to entitlements and, and, and our obligation to reach back and take in whoever is in need. Right? And I'm taking this very seriously, as you know, Mr. Mason. If we don't take particularly young African American men, if we don't grab the one that is closest to us, whether it is biological or not, and mentor these young men, we are going to continue to see the demise of our community and we will have no excuses. It will be our own fault. And I said, you know, Everybody talks about, well, it's education and it's policing. We want the police officers and we want school administrators and teachers to do all the work for us. Well, no, they got their own families, right? It's not their job to raise children. If you bring a child into the world, you should know where they are at any given time, particularly if they're under the age of 18. But there are too many of us that have given up. Too many of our adults 
that have brought children into the world, either they lack the parenting skills themselves, or they've deferred to their mother or grandmother to try to raise who they brought into the world. That's not fair. So personal responsibility is something that is a nonpartisan issue. It is nonpartisan. Don't get upset when Democrats or Republicans are saying, raise your damn children. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you were that, that independent to go get in the bed <laughs> and sleep with somebody, Amen. then you should be that independent and be responsible to raise them. That's not happening right now. That's not happening right now. That is not happening right now. The church, if you go in church and you start preaching this message, the minister, you talk, he's preaching to the choir. Everybody that's in church is doing more often than not, they're doing it. It's the ones that aren't in church, right? We can't extend the school day. What do we need, boot camp? Do we need boarding schools at this point? What are we gonna do? African-American young men, not all, are astray and they need to be mentored. They have to be mentored, you have to grab them. Anything short of that, we will fail. We will fail. So, well, education is the key. Critical thinking skills, the kind that we neglect sometimes in K-12 education, but we encourage you to develop in places of higher learning like Southern, are the essential skills that our neighborhoods, our cities, and our state and our country and the world needs as life around us get more and more complex and interdependent. Um, I can tell you without fear of contradiction that a person with critical thinking skills in Louisiana is a rare commodity. <laughs> I work with a bunch of them. Uh, black. Too often what passes for leadership, right? Maybe somebody can give me their definition of leadership. But leadership is not just getting elected. It is so far from that. that pop, that's popularity contest sometimes. That's re name recognition and polling or apathy in our own community, right? You don't call that leadership, that's getting elected. That's offering yourself for, to serve a position. Once you get it, there's a difference between campaigning and governing, <coughs> right? There are a lot of people who get elected, but then when it's time to govern, they still campaigning because they worry about the next campaign. And what can I do in that two or four year period to solidify my position moving forward for longevity? Right? No, governing is what President Obama did. Oh, as soon as he got in, he said, look, I don't even know if I'm guaranteed another four, four years. So I got to get it in where I can. And he got it in. He's a laundry list of things that he did, notwithstanding the opposition, and had courage in the face of that opposition. That's what, in my mind, leadership is. It's the courage to stand up when you believe that it's right and ask people to follow you and go with you to this place, this unknown place. Unprecedented affordable, uh, patient protection affordable care act. How many people have tried it? For decades they've been trying to pass health care reform. Well this guy did it in four years, right? So, listen, listen, sir. So, I can set the, the, the willingness too often what passes for leadership in this state is not the ability to clearly or independ think, think independently but a willingness to take orders, follow directions, and ignore the impact of the policies and decisions you're being ordered to implement. That's what some people call leadership. There's always been a place for this kind of obedience. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, this kind of uh, obedience and, 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 and failure, or, or this order and belief system. But it's only recently that we've seen it flourish in public life in Louisiana where We've got legislators that I work with that are willing to rubber stamp yep. anything that the governor does. <laughs> I've seen it in a way of governing in this state government that I've never seen before. I worked as a floor leader for the Republican governor, Mike Foster. I worked as a floor leader for Governor Blanco. So across party lines, I've worked for all these years. But not until Governor Jindal has been in where I've seen uh, this uh, unhealthy governing system that I believe he's offering right now. In this area where conformity and silence are rewarded and free thinking and freedom of conscience are punished, getting an advanced degree in Louisiana is very nearly a revolutionary act. It's certainly radical. 
for what many of you are trying to do here, but absolutely necessary. It's radical because in order to get the degree, you have to be willing to develop very, the very skills that are guaranteed to get you in trouble, right? I think that's where some of my trouble started. Some of it is innate and genetic, I'm sure. But most of it started when I was in law school and they did all this Socratic method stuff and they started questioning and I questioned back. There's always a why, right? That part of what you're doing here, and I hope those that are not yet in the graduate program continue to do that because it's another level of offering critical strategic thinking skills, right? And that's very important in order to change things and not accept the status quo as I referenced before. So, you know, you've got to be able to develop these skills that are guaranteed to get you in trouble and the ability to think rationally and the ability to articulate an informed opinion, right? You can't just mumble jump. Communication skills are very important <laughs> to effectuate change. Don't get me wrong, there are places in Louisiana where these traits are valued. They just don't happen to be welcome in state government. As a citizen and an attorney and legislator and now chair of the party, I've had a front row seat on the attempt to run Louisiana as though it's a privately held company. That's where I feel like, you know, right now. Everything's about corporation and privatizing. Um, that kind of insular approach rarely works in business, uh, but it absolutely never works in a democratic republic like the one we are supposed to live in, like we have in the United States. Our form of government relies on timely access to information which affords the public the opportunity to make informed decisions or make an informed judgment about the work that government is doing in our name. Yes, it is supposed to be our government, our government. As the crisis and the crises, I should say, have mounted in Louisiana in recent months from the unfolding disaster of the governor's voucher plan to undermine public education, to the continuing cuts in higher education form funding, about 41% over the last five years, uh, to the <clears throat> cascading set of disasters resulting from the Medicaid cuts in healthcare, this current gubernatorial administration and state has entered into a period of political freefall. The only thing that could save us from the implosion is action by the legislature. And too often that does not seem to be the case in happening and there's no impetus to make the legislature <laughs> because of the rubber stamping and what I told you before about the lack of leadership and people willing to step up and be courageous and do what's right for their communities. For some reason they're scared of the government. I don't get it. The only thing that can save us is, is for the legislature to act and in the form of calling ourselves in to a special session to say look these are the priorities of the state and we, the people, through our representative form of government and legislature, expect more and want to do more and lay out an agenda for this state to address the fiscal, the realistic fiscal needs of Louisiana right now. And this is not happening in the next three months, I'd say, because of the governor's own political ambition. And you've seen, you've witnessed that over the, over the last uh, couple of years. Everything that he's done has been in furtherance of those political ambitions. And he just won't bring himself to do it, and so I'm pushing my colleagues to do it on our own. Uh, I believe that these crises are afflicting our state now, but it also affords us as a people an opportunity to revisit some clear policy choices and long-headed thinking to pull our state out of this mess and out of the nosedive that a continuation of the short-sighted failing policies will continue to give us. I hope that we're able to do something soon. One of the things I've noticed in my time in politics, and I grew up in a political household, my father was a tax assessor down in New Orleans and also an attorney, is that things begin changing a long time before the general public recognizes that change is underway. And so I think it's happening right now, but the broader, the masses may not see it. And I think that's where we are right now. If you look at it, you've got a major population of state employees, a major population of educators, whether it's teachers or school administrators, and you've got healthcare professionals, right? Hospital administrators, um, nurses and doctors, and patients all screaming at this one person and saying, please help us, right? Now, he's not listening right now. He's not reacting. He's actually hiding. But there's a movement going on, and I think it's mounting, and you're going to see 
people uh, get very, very upset. And I hope they, that, that it's evidenced by their vote. And I hope it's done right now, in the next two months. I think that's where we are right now. And if you go back to see the start of the last legislative session, the governor looked like he was invincible when we came in. He rammed his education bills through in two weeks, maybe less than that, like nine days. His allies might now wish that they hadn't rushed that because everybody's revisiting what they did in that nine days. They don't even know what they voted for. They just pressed yes because he told them to press yes. Uh, now they are realizing that they made some mistakes um, and the governor promised them all these things and all these projects and none of that has come to fruition because we don't have any money. Because he won't pass taxes and he keeps giving everything away to corporate, big corporate uh, interests. But as the session progressed, the point is, his retirement package, which was also a key piece of his, his package, it failed. It totally fell apart. And he couldn't even muster 53 votes in the House to get his uh, minimum foundation program approved. But uh, after he completed his veto of bills that, that passed during the session, the governor outright lost a majority of the House on the matter of a veto, a veto override session. Most of the members decided that, even though the Senate didn't do it, um, I was on the minority side, but the Senate voted not to have an override session. So there were a lot of bills that we passed, the governor vetoed, we wanted to go back into session. The Senate submitted enough ballots to prevent us going back into session to override him. The House didn't win. The House is 105 minutes. He could not get 53 people to say, let's not have an override session. So he is falling apart. His whole, you know, people are beginning to see through it, I think. Um, the only reason it didn't happen is because of, uh, of, of the Senate, as I said. Um, they, they didn't do it. And that was before the Medicaid cuts were forced on the state in the current fiscal year, when Senator David Ditter, who, are you all familiar with that? I don't know what's happening with Medicaid right now in the hospital system. Well, the, the, the crux of it is that Senator Ditter was on the conference committee um, between the House and the Senate, and there was this mistake that was made after the last disaster, okay? We knew that it was a mistake, but we were still reaping the benefits, multi-million dollar benefits, as a contribution to our health care system. Well, the Congress, the Republican Congress, wanted more money, right? It was trying to cut programs. They knew that this was a mistake and Louisiana didn't deserve this money. So they came back, it was called a clawback provision. They clawback, came back and took the money back before we expected them to. Governor Jindal didn't expect them to come and get it back until 2014. But that's his Republican colleagues. He didn't make one phone call to say, don't take the money back, we need it. Didn't make one phone call. Senator Landrieu begged him to make one phone call to Speaker Boehner, to Chairman Upton from Michigan, and he wouldn't make the call, and that cost us $800 million. And that's why you see what is going on in every public hospital, whether it's Shawbear or Lolly Kim or Charity. All of the hospitals are suffering because this guy wouldn't make one call. That's all. <laughs> one call. Because what is political, national, political ambition? And I can't make this up. I hope somebody's taping it. Oh. <laughs> Since the law passed, the general administration has engaged in a game of keeping away from legislators all the implications for all these hospitals. And he's been going to extremes to keep us out of, of the loop. In fact, he's, I think he's pressuring a Democratic chairman of a committee on the Senate side, Health and Welfare, from not even having oversight here. David Heitmeyer is a good friend, but we can't get him to have oversight hearings on an issue, a health care crisis. Because I think he's fearful of losing his chairmanship. Once again, courage, where is it? Who do you answer to? Do you answer to the people in your district? Or do you answer to the guy who got elected to the governor's mansion? It's ridiculous. Democrats are in a position right now to offer some leadership because Republicans now find themselves split by this factional infighting, whether it's Tea Party or is right, or people in the healthcare industry. They're so uh, factional that it's plaguing their party. And we have an opportunity to offer leadership on multiple fronts. This Medicaid fiasco um, is going to require new revenue without a question. And so it's going to be a problem for a governor who has said we're not going to raise any taxes to support higher education or health care, right? But there are Republicans in the legislature that can't have their McNeese or Nickel State 
or University of Louisiana at Monroe or Louisiana Tech, they can't have those universities shut down. They can't have those hospitals shut down. So at some point, you've got to find some money, whether it's reducing the revenue of the tax credits, rebates, and exemptions that you give to corporations, or it's increasing revenue like tobacco taxes and dedicating it to health care, which 78% of the people in Louisiana support. Whatever way you do it, you've got to increase what we get in, in, in our state coffers. And so it's an opportunity for us to do some things in a bipartisan way to show leadership right here in Louisiana. Some, some people argue that the budgets that we pass in the legislature are moral documents and they're an expression of our values and our priorities. I would say that it is. And our recent budgets, what they've said about Louisiana um, is that our priorities are ensuring that the most comfortable among us, those that have, are able to make more. And while those that are unfortunate and have less and don't have enough need, they, they enough need to access government, they need to access government services ranging from education and healthcare. Guess what? They're on their own. They're on, you're on your own, as they would say. I don't know what other conclusion that you can draw from these budgets that slash healthcare and higher education. That's just a road scholar, by the way. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Slash, and who's, who used to be over the University of Louisiana system. Hmm has slashed higher education for 41% or 41% in the last five years. It's nonsensical. I don't know what other conclusion that you can draw, but to say that the, at least the actions are amoral. And I'm not gonna say the person is, I can not keep it, make it personal. But certainly the actions are not one based in morality um, and compassion and sincerity for the least of those. This administration's priorities are clearly wrong, and the people have started to catch on. And he's, unfortunately, though, the governor hasn't shown, we have shown signs of changing, but he hasn't shown any sign of changing. That responsibility falls on us, and we're hoping to get some movement there. But we need you to do it. We need to ensure that Louisiana says yes. And in order for me to move, as I'm just saying, as an individual legislature, that requires you to engage with me, right? Now, I might come to the conclusion on my own, and I may be a little bit of an anomaly, right? A little bit more vocal, a little bit more independent, and a little bit more passionate about this piece. But there are people that represent you now, because even though you're here in Southern, I suspect that many of you live all over the state and have representatives and legislators all over the state. When's the last time you emailed them and told them that you're kind of ticked off with what's happening in higher education? I'm kind of mad that I, these tuition fees keep getting increased. Why did the state just decrease its contribution and you're putting that burden on me and my family, right? And you give me rhetoric to say that you believe in higher education being the answer to independence in my future, right? When's the last time you sent an email to your legislator? Anybody, raise a hand, please. One, two, three. And you wonder why there's no change. They haven't heard from you. And when people don't hear from you, they get the ability, they have the ability to be complacent and do what they always do. Status quo. No change. So I'm not saying you have to rise up, I'm not saying you have to protest in front of their offices, but certainly sending them an email and letting them know how you feel, or calling them, or saying, I want to come and visit with you, will trigger something for those that you have elected and make sure that they're responsive to what you believe are important. If you don't call them, let me be clear about something. The Tea Party is on and popping. <laughs> okay? They're calling and email. The people on the other side that have a totally different view from what you stand, they are engaged. It's not enough to talk to the TV or talk at the dinner table. Or talk in church. You better be talking to somebody who has the ability to influence, to change, and act, and press that red or green button. And that doesn't just go for the legislature. That's the city council, the Congress, the U.S. Senate, the sheriff, the coroner. For all I care. They're all elected. Public Service Commission. Go down the list. If you mad, tell them. That's what we're here for. I get it all the time. I call, too. <laughs> oh, that's not, that's not state government. That's local government. I'm calling my council. Engagement. So it's our job to make sure that this change happens. The, the governor's political stunt declaring that Louisiana won't implement 
the what we call Obamacare. And I'm going to refer to it as Obamacare because that's a good thing. If I could find a way to say Peterson Cares and claim it, I would change the name of the law. And I would be proud to say I passed Peterson Care. Because if you know the components of the law, what it's done for people, you should embrace it. Just put an S on it, Obama cares, right? Obama cares. It's caused, I'm sure, many of you to be able to stay on your parents' insurance policy while you're in school, up until the age of 20, right? So if you're insured now, might not otherwise be, as a result of the president taking a courageous stance, right? But this governor says, no way, 366,000 people in the state of Louisiana, you're not going to have insurance in 2014 when the law is supposed to be implemented. You're not going to have insurance. Because I don't want to implement that. Well, why don't you want to implement it? It doesn't make sense. We should do it another way. Well, what way should we do it? Silence. No answer. No alternative. Just not that. Can't do what that guy says. We can infer why there was opposition. We can infer. But he's not said why exactly. I tried to pass a bill during the session for health ex insurance exchanges so that small businesses and individuals would be prepared in the case that the law was deemed constitutional, right? Well, the governor came in, killed it. I put a provision though, I was bar bipartisan support. I put a provision that said, if the Supreme Court says it's unconstitutional, this law will go away. So no worries, and my Republican colleagues were like, Karen, this makes sense, let's get ready because it's gonna insure a lot of people, 366,000 people. So, got it passed out of one committee, insurance committee. Governor came in, used his big stick, told all of his friends, all his rubber stampers, vote against it because this is bad, this is Obamacare. They killed it. Well, now we don't have anything, and as soon as the Supreme Court acted to say that it's constitutional, we now have nothing to prepare. Now there, you know, you're gonna, mark my words, invite me back please in January or February. Please invite me back. You're invited. Please invite me back. <laughs> I promise you he will have changed his tune as soon as this election is over. Because there's no alternative to covering that many people. And it's something, I don't want to get too much into the minutia of it, but the DISH dollars, when an indigent person, we have a safety net program with our LSU system, right? And so when an indigent person shows up at a hospital because they need care, the hospital has to take care of them. Mm -hmm. But who pays for that? Well, taxpayers pay for that, right? And it comes back through the form of what we call DISH dollars, disproportionate share dollars, right? And so what the federal government has done with the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, is said, look, we're going to reduce the DISH dollars so you don't have to get reimbursed. We have less of that because everybody will be insured. The people that are currently uninsured will be insured so when they show up, and even though they can't afford it, they're going to have this new insurance plan that's been created. And so you won't need these DISH dollars. So what happens if what happens when Bobby Jindal says we're not going to implement the law and the dish dollars are eliminated. So they're not insured, nor are the hospitals getting reimbursement. Are you with me? Oh, yeah. So what happens then? <laughs> well, guess what? The hospitals say, hell no. <laughs> I'm in this for a profit. Yeah. I'm talking about, you know, Ochsner or Tulane. And I'm not talking about LSU. When you show up, you're supposed to get, and that's what they rely on all these years. Well, the, the whole system nationally is changing. And so we're saying we don't want to participate in this national change to the detriment of our own people. Second point to note, as you argue this, as you advocate for the next two months for the person in the White House to be reelected, is to know that when we turn down the money, the millions and billions of dollars, it goes to, a, it doesn't, it's not like they send us a rebate check and say, oh, Louisiana, you don't want to participate, let me send you some money back. Because we all pay federal taxes, so it goes up. This is like a reinvestment, a return on your investment. When you send money to tax, right, up in taxes, you're supposed to get some government services, right? Well, we're not getting any back. We're gonna say no, like we said no to broadband, no to early childhood, like we said no to house be real. Well, when we don't get it back, it's not like it's not gonna be spent. It's going to Ohio and Virginia and California and Mississippi and Pennsylvania. They get to, they're gonna, their governors aren't stupid. <laughs> <laughs> wow. take it and spend it. It goes right back in the pool. And that's what happened with a lot of these other programs. The stimulus dollars, they got spent. They got people getting high speed rail right now, brand new early childhood education programs, right? Rural broadband. Amazing. But our guy says no. That's your gun. Y'all are No. I promise y'all didn't.
I voted for Tara Hollis, teacher from North Louisiana. All right. Um, let me tell you something. I'm not even going to go with any more on this. I'm going to take some questions because yeah. I know the time is probably getting short. And um, <laughs> I'm going to end with this. I, I know that there's a lot of intellectual capacity in this room that is being underutilized, right? And you don't have to come up to me and say, what can I do, Karen? What can I do to help the party? Or what can I do to help my community, right? In your sphere of influence, whether it's church, whether it's your child's school, whether it's the community center, the homeless shelter, the blood center, Red Cross, right? There's so many places where you can offer a couple of hours a week of service and give back, right? Or you can do it in a partisan way and, and political way. But even more simply, with respect to the next, what, 50 days or so, if we don't re-elect President Obama, you, I can't describe to you how devastating it will be. Only you can do your analysis of the Ryan, Romney Ryan budget for your life. The Pell Grant, anybody get Pell Grants from here? Yeah, I just stopped right there. 99. <laughs> I didn't say 99.9%. If you continue to have investments uh, or, or policies that benefit that 1%, that benefit that 1%, then go vote for the other side and encourage your family and friends to either stay home or vote for the other side. But if you want to see fairness and equitable policies passed on a grand scale, and continued courageous leadership. Let me give you this. If you thought those things that he did in the first four years were bold, imagine when he's lame duck, the kinds of things that he can accomplish with the sign, just a, one signature, the kind of executive orders, right, that can change things that we have been trying to change for the last 50 years. This is real. This is going to impact your children and grandchildren, right? Major, major implications. So I implore you to, to talk to your family and friends and encourage them to participate on November the 6th and to be active, actively engaged in moving not just our country forward, but our state. So I stand ready to be your partner. Yes, sir. I recall back to seven when Dr. Samuel and others marched from this campus to uh, elementary school of what was the name? Rosewald Elementary. Put us a precinct on this campus, the FD Clark Center. And now they're threatening to close it down because we like the participation. People here tell me that we can't force our kids who live in a dorm to at least register to vote at our own precinct on our campus. Your response to that? Well, the, my response is number one: you can't force them to. All right. Uh, that would be legal. Illegal. All right. You can you can encourage, and you can like. Strong man. You can if encourage pretty strongly. Close us down right now. Well, I think close we, this precinct down where we used to march. I understand. Yes. Yeah, okay. I understand. But if the if the if the students don't value the convenience for voting, that would be evident in them not registering, right? Yeah. So. It would be my opinion that there should be an organized effort door to door from those that live on campus right. with an education about, you know, number one, are you registered? This would be my approach. Are you registered to vote? Here, yeah, and they say, you say where, you know? Would you like to vote here on campus? It's very convenient for all of the elections while you're here as a student, right? Say, okay, well, yeah. Most would say yes, I think. If there was direct engagement, one-on-one, -on -one, organized efforts with just 10% of the people in this room dedicating one Saturday for four hours, Saturday morning, for four hours from 8 to 12. This could be done next Saturday yes. with one flyer and then a copy of a voter registration form. And if they say, yes, I mean, it does make sense. Well, you can vote right here for all the elections for the next four years. Here's the registration. Drop it off downstairs. Or I'll wait. I'll be back. I'm going to make rounds in the dorm, and I'll be back to pick it up from you. You mark it on your sheet. You come back and pick it up. Well, I would suspect by next Saturday at 2 o'clock, you might have four or 500 new registered voters. If there was a 
very organized, concerted effort to do it. Thank you. And I'll be happy to participate for anybody who would like to do it. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Sure. Um, when I first came, uh, I did receive a speaking register in Baton Rouge. I mean, I didn't understand it, but as time went on, I did understand it. And I registered before the time. Um, we, had, we had some votes for the uh, the changes that are going on even right here in Louisiana where people who are discouraging uh, uh, folks to, to participate on election day. You know, I'm sure you've read about some of it nationally in Pennsylvania, voter ID laws and things like that. So there are people that are, like back in the 60s when they were trying to have all these uh, tests and things like that to make you see, if you get, lay out new criteria. So those kinds of initiatives are going on. You'd be surprised right now. But the good thing is, it, I think two, one of two things happen. Either the person that registered you or did somebody register or you did it yourself? Um, it was some, I registered twice, like something here, like yeah. I turned it into someone. Yeah, that person may not have turned it in, number one, or they may not have turned it in timely, so the time frame for that particular election might have passed for registration, right? So um, why don't you, is, is there anybody who works in the, I think you could probably <laughs> seek him, or Ebony, Ebony or Ebony? Ebony? Yeah, we'll get it. Okay, we'll get. We'll make sure you're straight and you know exactly where you're going on November 6th at 6:01 a.m. Right? <laughs> we're gonna take care. Because yeah. you want to do it early. You don't want to be in that long, long line. That's gonna be out there re reelect President Obama. You don't want to be in that. Yeah. Who else? Yes, sir. Um, good. Good. Yes, sir. I think I did an absentee last time. I did nine. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly supportive of the initiative, and what ha well, the reason that the governor said he objected to it, I don't believe it, the reason that he put on paper was that there was not enough of a local contribution toward the initiative, right? The money that the federal government was offering was not being t funded in its entirety. It was for the initial plan, right? But he said that the locals were not going to be contributing not going to have enough money to offer this. And then local governments started standing up like Baton Rouge and everything between Baton Rouge and New Orleans saying, well, no, we would put up our amount, our fair share, because this is important long-term infrastructure investment. We get it. Just like, you know, when they did the, the, the utilities years ago, decades ago, right? That's the same kind of thing as broadband. So people, are, people do have visions, although the governor might not think that, and can see through his rhetoric. The, I support the initiative. I think that there is a future for it. Um, you know, it would be my opinion that the president, if he were to do another initiative for high-speed rail and lay out that planning money, that he would not do it in a way that required the governors of the states to sign off on it, right? And that maybe a collective group, a collaboration of local government leaders could sign off and say, we want it from Now, that, that's not good policy. I'm not, it's not really sound policy, it's not the best way to do it, but just like tobacco tax. He wouldn't do a statutory, he wouldn't sign a statutory law, and to put, even though the legislature passed it overwhelmingly, over two-thirds of the House and Senate. So we had to put it in the Constitution. We had to put a tax, a renewal in the Constitution. That's horrible policy for anybody in law school, right? You should not put taxes in the Constitution. You should have the ability to go statutorily to amend it and adjust it as the time changes. But he wanted, we had to go to the people and have them add that to our Constitution. I think similarly, we're going to have to look at outside the box alternative ways of accomplishing our goals because we got a knucklehead. <laughs> <laughs> Is there an effort 
to flip the state? <clears throat> and is it like? It's very difficult in the next two months. I've been uh, chair of the party for the last four months, uh -huh. and my intent is to turn this red state blue over time. Okay. Thank you. I am very optimistic. That is all going to be determined by the level of participation of the 1.4 million Democrats to the 700,000 Republicans. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah. We got more Democrats in the state than Republicans currently registered, but they're not participating, right? So it's in part my hands offering leadership in laying out what it means to be a Democrat, uh, making sure that we can sh distinguish between their side and our side, right? Which they all should be on our side because we stand up for working class people all the time. I rarely hear that on the other side. Um, I'll just hear about smaller government. So I think that for this election, it's going to be very difficult, honestly. It's gonna be very, very difficult to do um, unless people really wake up and start shaking people up more and having them wake up. Uh, but in the shorter term, and I say short term, four years, right? Uh, next, the next federal election cycle, which they call the midterm elections in 2014, I think we're going to have change. I'm in the process of recruiting more congressional candidates for the party. Um, and by next 2013, we're going to have a state convention. 2014, we're going to elect, re-elect U.S. Senator Mary Landrieu and have more competitive congressional races and add some Democrats to these these Republican seats like Cassidy and Fleming. And we're already down there with Bustani and Landry trying to mix that up with a guy named Ron Richard, who has a decent shot of getting into the runoff. But we're gonna do more of that in 2014. And in 2015, we're gonna have an entire slate of state office uh, candidates seeking offices from agriculture commissioner to insurance commissioner, lieutenant governor and governor, along with trying to take the House and Senate back majority. We have a plan, right? I'm gonna lay it out and I'm going to ask that it be implemented by people like Ebony and, uh, and our new team at the Louisiana Democratic Party. But we need you. We absolutely need you to be a part of it. Uh, but the president will win. The president will win this oh, yeah. Romney is getting this win. Well, I can't get it. I thought Miss Amy was bad. This guy is hard. <laughs> but I love it. I mean, it's, it's very entertaining. So when he goes to London, puts his foot in his mouth, you know. In the middle of a foreign policy crisis, we lose a Libyan ambassador, and you are criticized, you bring in politics into that? We haven't even more, the guy's body hasn't even gotten back to the United States, and you're talking crazy. He's nuts, he's absolutely nuts. And all of his Republican, you know, all the spin doctors, they say he's nuts. <laughs> he's nuts, he's nuts. And so, I mean, he's, a lot of folks are falling off, but that we shouldn't get complacent and comfortable. And we still need to do our part of it, just to, yes sir. Uh, anyone else? Yes sir. A large proportion of the poor and working class, even middle class people here in Louisiana and the South in general, they vote according to some ideology, some values. My question is, how can we help these people free themselves in yeah. uh, the, the question was, you know, we've got a lot, a large portion um, of uh, impoverished people here that vote. They're ideologues of sorts. They vote <coughs> so, a certain ideology, and they need to be freed from themselves, essentially. And how can we help them free them, free them from themselves? Well, what, what Karl Marx call it, false consciousness. False consciousness, exactly. So I think that through um, education, I'll give you an example. I, was, I have a Monday, every Monday, I'm going to have a conference call with my executive director of the party. On the way here, I was on the call, and one of the things that we're working on right now are issue forums. And so Louisiana Democratic Party is traditionally, but we've got, so you know our structure. We're based here in Baton Rouge on Government Street, our offices, but we've got 64 chapters. Every, every, every parish has a chapter of the party. They haven't been really active and engaged. So my thing is to stand up what we call the Democratic Parish Executive Committee. If we stand 64 parishes up, then I got 64 spokes in a wheel, and that wheel starts turning, right? So I'm doing it bottom up, not top down, but bottom up. And so I've asked that my team to host issue forums 
on things like health care. In the next two weeks, we're going to have Caddo and Wachita and Calcasieu and East Baton Rouge, and some of the larger ones, and some of the rural areas, host these forums on the things I'm talking about, Medicaid and, and, and Obamacare, right? And educating people so they know what it means for them and their bottom line. Similarly, economically, what does it mean? That